my life is so much richer than it was before I did this. And I do like, it's, it's, I've done it for long enough that it's confusing to me when people are talking about like what they're giving up to do it. I'm like, what are you talking about? You like get so fucking much more. <laughs> yeah. Like I have so much time to do stuff and like people to see and just things that I can become interested in that I never had before. Like when I was only trying to be good at one thing and pretty much do one thing all the time and like ignore my body and mind. And yeah, it's like to me a much, much richer life than uh, not doing it. Welcome to Advanced Retro Adaptics. I'm Tyler Disney. And today I'm having a conversation with Brian, who many of you will know as Gin and Juice from the Erie Forums. Welcome, Brian. Hey, what's up? So I want to quickly set the stage. So, Brian, you live in New Orleans. You love New Orleans. Um, yes. You have a part-time job that you you work like one day a weekend at something like uh, that? I, I, that was true like before the pandemic. And then I got moved to basically a sweeter situation, which made me work more. So now I probably work like three days a week. Three days a week. Okay. Yeah. We're, we'll, we'll talk about that more. Um, you run a record label. You do a lot of music stuff. Uh, you dumpster dive a lot. Uh, and you just have a ton of other like interests and activities, a lot of stuff that I want to get into. Um, but maybe I thought that we could start with the story of your life immediately after you finished undergrad and moved to New York City. Why did you move to New York City and how did that go? Uh, I moved to New York City because I was trying to work in the music industry and I went to college right outside New York City and that was sort of always my plan. And I think I also just wanted to... I don't know, moved to New York City. I, I grew up. I grew up outside of Philadelphia, so it's not horribly far away. But I didn't just want to like move to Philadelphia, and like I, you know, I don't know. I guess I just wanted to do the biggest thing, which was moving to New York. And then I also felt like you pretty much, if you want to work, I was trying to work in a recording studio, so you need to either pretty much live in LA, New York, or Nashville, or like possibly Atlanta at that time. So New York was like where the college that I wanted to go to was, and is also probably like felt easier because it was the closest of those cities to where I grew up. And how'd that go when you got there? And it went great. <laughs> it was, that was a wild time. That was like, uh, I really credit that part of my life for like changing a large portion of my life. Um, yeah, I just, I didn't, honestly, I just didn't have very much like self-confidence before then. And then I like moved to New York and worked in this reporting studio, which I didn't think was like a life you could lead. And I was also really concerned because I grew up in the suburbs and I still went to college in the suburbs and just like, I just don't really like that lifestyle. And I didn't, I didn't like meet people who thought like me. I just didn't really feel like I fit in. And I kind of felt like everyone was going down this like one path of life. And I didn't, I knew that I didn't want to do that. And so I was just like, I guess I'll just be alone and some sad person forever. I feel really fortunate, actually, that I, like, went for my dreams and, like, did this path that was kind of, like, not the best, you know, or safest career path because, like, I didn't realize when I moved into New York that that would be, like, where I found my people and that I pretty much just need to live in, like, a uh, interesting urban center. But that's what I, so, like, I don't, I wouldn't, I don't think I would have just done that. On, I don't think I would have figured that out on my own. So it's like you didn't you didn't necessarily know that that's where you wanted to be, but you just knew that where you were wasn't. So you went anywhere else or somewhere else, right? I mean, I think it was, kind of I was honestly just pursuing uh, the job thing at that point. Like, okay. I just sort of got lucky because like the way that I was kind of raised to think about stuff, right, is like there's a lot of focus on like going to a good college and getting a job, which I like didn't go to a good college for like a safe degree, which is what I was supposed to do. But I went to a college for a degree. And so I was just like really job focused. I also, you know, my parents weren't unsupportive about it, but they definitely weren't like pleased with my decision to go for a sound recording to college, which is honestly kind of a stupid degree to get. <laughs> but, but, uh, <laughs> they like, they were, yeah, they were like unsupportive, but I, I, it was like very clear to me that they're like, you're choosing a harder path, you know? So I was like very motivated to work really hard back then. I was really into like working and I was honestly also like pretty depressed and like, I don't know, I was really good at school. Uh, the college I went to was super easy and I did really well there. 
and I was like, I might have had like the top GPA in my program. And I listened to the same kind of music the professors did, which really helped. I was in the studio all the time, which they liked. I was just like a star student. So it was like, that was kind of the only part of my life that was like really working for me at that point. So once I got out of school, I was like, well, the only thing that's working is school. You know, I need to get a job. And I also like really didn't want to move back home. So my it was, that point, my motivation was much more just like avoiding a couple of things I knew I didn't want to do rather than like having a clear path. Got it. You, you've mentioned that you, 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 you've had a uh, frugality as a value or a skill since forever. And also like an understanding of how investing works or the, the idea that you can live off of investing. Like, where did that come from? Uh, those are both ideas that my parents gave me. Um, I don't, I think it was pretty much my mom because that was pretty much who raised me. Like my dad never didn't have contact with us, but he wasn't like around a ton. So they both, they both are frugal and talking about financial stuff. I think the investing stuff specifically came from mom, but this was also like back in, uh, you know, she was talking to me about this when I was a kid. So in the nineties, when all investment books were like, yeah, you just make 12%. Like you just buy some blue chips and it's 12% automatic. <laughs> so Bam, so like she got me very excited about investment returns because I was, you know, I mean, 12%, if you just compound that, like over a short period of time, you have like a shit ton of money. You don't even need to start with that much money. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so that was where I figured out that a, a much heavier influence though was the frugality because just both my parents are like, I mean, you know, to me, there's a distinction between cheapness and frugality and both of them have aspects of both of those things but neither of them are like big huge spenders and when i was younger we lived in a very very expensive area they kind of subscribed to the like suburban ideal of like you know i really hate the suburban ideal so i put everything bad in it but (laughs) to me it's like to me like the ideal is honestly that you never have enough stuff right it's like it's like maximum consumption but like definitely like having a nice house and a nice car which we did not have i was grew up under the impression that we were like very poor and then when i went to college and met people who were like much poorer by american standards i was like oh no we just like were relatively poor for the like exceedingly wealthy area we grew up in mm-hmm. but like that kind of like made us be frugal and they it also wasn't just about like not having stuff like it was there was an emphasis on like even though they weirdly wanted to have all this stuff, there's also an emphasis on like not building your entire identity around stuff. I don't know. I guess it's a weird, it's, it's kind of maybe a bit of like cognitive dissonance there for, from like their perspective, but yeah, it was, they're just, neither of them really have really flashy stuff or like spend a lot of money. They both like were into saving for their for like a normal retirement but so yeah so but i definitely there's definitely like and also in my mom's side of the family just like going back to my grandparents and like that whole side of the family they're like very almost like it's almost like a problem how they are sometimes (laughs) or they're just they're very it's not the frugality it's they're like very conservative they're very worried about money there is like a fear aspect certainly in Uh. their frugality but uh I don't know. Yeah. So I just had that like ingrained in me from a young age. Like, I don't know. I guess if you grow up, it's hard for me to understand people who grew up seeing their parents, like my parents did. And, you know, my parents ended up being in like house and car debt, but that was like, you know, the good debt. Like, you know, it's, they never, they didn't like ever go on cruises with credit cards, which like, I guess a lot of people's families do. I don't know. I don't, it's hard for me to like relate to that sort of, like, if you have to get out of that sort of mindset, I'm like, I don't know how to help you. I just, like, we didn't do that shit, so. Right, yeah, you can't really. Yeah. Yeah, I, f- it, it, I feel like I grew up, uh, like, my parents are, fr- like, frugal as well. Not, like, super duper frugal. Um, But I, 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 like, never understood investing or anything like that. Like, literally never occurred to me. Um, So that's that's i'm a little jealous that you got that at an earlier age because i'm like man if i'd known that <laughs> some things would have been different in my life but well, you i mentioned- actually did it. i didn't end up using it because i kind of like lumped so the frugality aspect was much more like i think ingrained into me 
like without my knowledge, you mm-hmm. know, like that was just like part of how it was without thinking about it. The investment stuff was not. And also their, I, their investment plan was not good. Like it's just, you can't, that's not actually how investing works. Like they don't really know that much about investing and they just like, we're like, yeah, you just do this. And then it's like this crazy mm-hmm. return. And uh, I graduated college uh, the year that like everything, that the stock market and housing market crashed. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Or maybe I, it might've been a little bit around the time I graduated college. I graduated college in 2009. I think that happened in 2007, if I remember, or 2008. Anyway, it was like, and so like I was in the process of like throwing out everything I had, or like trying to throw out what I'd learned from my parents at that point and like <laughs> living in New York City, working at a recording studio. And like, what is not popular with people who live who are like in the music industry is like investing and thinking about the future. So, and I was like, well, this whole entire thing just fucking fell apart. Right. Like everyone just lost their entire retirement. Like mm. I was not like, uh, so I ended up saving by like buying a bunch of music equipment, which I still have. So like, I guess it kind of worked. Um, but yeah, I was kind of in the mindset of like investing in a business, I guess, or like investing the money into like a career that I wanted more than, like, I mean, shit, if I had fucking bought into the stock market, then I'd be fucking, you know, that was like the best time to buy shit. Yeah. And also like real estate too. But and yeah, yeah. then by a lot of like people in the music industry, that was also like, there's obviously that huge real estate drive up. So like, there's a lot of fast money, which people in the music industry love. And so a lot of my friends in college were like, oh, you should invest in real estate. It can't go down. It's impossible. And right. Like, that is, I know that's wrong. I don't know why just, that never <laughs> works. <laughs> that's like, that's like the first thing you learn is that, is that everything goes up and down. And I was just like, no, man. And so like, to me, when the shit all crashed, I was just like, oh yeah, this doesn't work at all. So I actually didn't start investing until I discovered like the fire move bit. And that was what convinced me to start investing. Cause I had totally disregarded that piece. I had generally only had like $2,000 at any time. I did have a ton of guitars, which I could have sold, I guess. But yeah, so I don't know. It didn't really help me you know, about investing. I was I was just aware of the concept. So I guess when I like reheard it, I didn't have to like understand that that was something one could do. I was like, oh yeah, I like this is an interesting take on that. Because it was also the the way it was sold to me is you do this until you're like seventy, and then if the stars fucking align for you, you can like continue to live your normal life, not like. It just the sales pitch wasn't good. That's not how you pitch it to me. You pitch it to me by being like, you do whatever the fuck you want when you're like now. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you just gotta save for like three fucking years, and then you're golden. Well, I was like, oh, yeah. now I'm interested. You know, I yeah, you put like, it like that. Yeah. So what? At what point did you get into like Erie? Because you found Erie first, right? I found the first thing I ever read of Fire was the Erie book, but I didn't. I didn't like. I don't know. I mean, I feel a little bit weird because I like personally talked to Jacob and Elfin, Honestly, <laughs> there's like if you're reading that book with like through a skeptical lens, he comes off like kind of bitter in the book a little bit, and then yeah, it's just like. I mean, I was living on very little money and had already lived on really low money, but even like seven thousand dollars a year, I was like, this is just like no money. I was also used to buying tons of musical equipment, which I was kind of in this. I'd kind of been like in the space of like work to get a bunch of money, spend it on music equipment. And that's like, that's kind of like fun. So I was like, not really wanting to like give that up when I first read it. And it just was, it was too extreme, honestly. Like I was just like, I mean, I was honestly like, I think closer than a lot of people to doing it, but I was just like, yeah, I don't know. I'm kind of already at the bottom. I didn't see, I was not convinced of the point of becoming more frugal than I already was. And I was like, this guy, his fucking seven thousand dollars a year in his trailer <laughs> and so like like later you found uh mr money mustache right and that made more sense to you. yes yeah and i actually have to credit my ex-girlfriend she found both of them uh and was like hey you're cheap <laughs> you'd be into this <laughs> and well she was also like interested you know we were she was a journal or is a journalist and i was like kind of i mean i was in i was in grad school at that point but uh you know still very much a musician and like i don't know we were we we're both always like scheming on ways that we could do our shit more or like not do stuff we didn't want to do so yeah uh i don't know she's she was just kind of like i think you might find this interesting and then 
Yeah, Mr. Money Mustache is like, you know, I mean, he had he's a better like. Jacob is very like cut and dry, and there's a lot of like wisdom in that book. But like, it's not the greatest sales pitch if you're trying to like convince a brand new person that it's a good idea. And like, Mr. Money Mustache is like much more sales pitchy and like flashy, and the like writing is more exciting and. It's also like he writes a lot about shit that's not as difficult to understand as opposed to like writing a little bit about shit that you kind of have to think about for a while. And so again, for like getting into it, like I've read the early retirement extreme book a bunch of times now and I always get something new out of it, which is like not true of Mr. Money Mustache posts, but like in terms of being kind of like getting the initial spark and becoming interested, like Mr. Money Mustache was way more helpful to me just because I don't know, like I was annoyed by the shit that he's like how he's like these fucking people in their cars like yeah fuck cars like <laughs> <laughs> i was just like i was like i am mad about the stuff and then it was like yeah i mean i had already heard of the concept of investing to save money and i was like oh this guy's getting like a five percent return like this seems you know feasible and like the stock market had gone up back up by that point and it was like i was like okay and he'd also, he was already, he, by the time I found that website, Mr. Money Mustache was like already retired. So yeah, I was like, this guy already fucking did it, which Jacob did too, to be fair to him. But like, uh, yeah, the sales pitch was there and then that was there. And so, yeah, I read that entire, like I read the entire website when I found it over the course of like, I don't know how long, but I was like, I was also like in grad school, not super stoked on being in grad school as opposed to like when I worked in the music industry, I was, like, into it. So, <laughs> I was, like, I was, I had already been disillusioned from working, kind of. Like, my dream job had already failed after two years, so. So, you, uh, your your dream job was the sound recording, uh, sound engineering in uh, New York City at the studio. And you, you did that for two years before it, before it failed out? Yeah, it's just, like, that job, and particularly, I was, I was, like into this so i made it even worse but like that job is your entire life when you do it especially when you're younger and you know you're just starting out that's kind of the point i also didn't i didn't really think it was like possible to do it so i didn't have great vision of like what i was doing after i achieved it like i kind of hmm. when i got actually hired out of my internship that was kind of my goal <laughs> was achieved like i mean you know that you're not you're making like ten dollars an hour as a studio assistant at that point and like there's much more shit you could achieve but i was just like I really didn't think that I would be able to do that. So, like, once I did it, I was, I wasn't like, oh, this is over. Like, I still wanted the next levels of achievement, but I was also like, oh, I don't know. Like, really, my major goal was achieved, and I did what I. I don't think I, if you'd asked me, I would have said that I achieved what I did. But like looking back, I'm like, yeah, I, don't know, I worked at a major recording studio for two years. Like, uh, I proved that I could work in a major recording studio <laughs> to myself, <laughs> and. Yeah, it's just your whole mm. life, and eventually I, like, wanted to do other shit. You know, I was also, I mean, I was in my early 20s then, like, I don't know, I'd never done anything as an adult. It's like, just starting out as an adult, I'd already, like, devoted my entire life to one thing. Like, I just slowly, I don't know, I wanted to, like, go bike around a park sometimes, and, like, uh, yeah, I also don't, I, like, I would have, I mean, I, it's not the fault of that job but just combined with like being sort of depressed like i was not living a sustainable lifestyle like i was barely sleeping i like was doing a fair amount of drugs i drank constantly like just fucking like sleeping outside a lot <laughs> um so yeah i don't know it's not like the healthiest lifestyle i don't think I, that was like a conscious decision but yeah that's a long way of saying i just basically got burned out but sure it, it was also kind of like the disillusionment of the plan of my entire life at that point and it wasn't so much like i don't want to do this anymore it was just like maybe this is not the best life plan and maybe there's some other shit i would like to do while i'm still like young mm -hmm. like what um well i wanted to learn how to do other shit i didn't like know how to do anything i was i really wanted to learn how to cook back then which i did do and uh wanted to go on like some bike trips which i haven't really done but I certainly have a lot more free time to like bike around the cities where I've lived and just like be in a park sometimes. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, just any, I'll, any like normal young person stuff, like just <laughs> hang out with my friends. All of my entire social network was like entirely based on people I worked with. So, like, 
who are also like really insanely into their jobs. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Every single person I work with who wanted a career in the music industry has one now. Like eighty percent of the people I worked with, like, have music industry careers still. So yeah, all of them are <laughs> very dedicated. Um, you've had a like a uh, you've had a, a non traditional relationship with housing for quite some time. Uh, and that started in New York City, right? Uh, yes, yeah. It's funny because yes. like I just read your journal, so I feel like some some of the stuff might be fresher in my mind than in your mind. <laughs> <laughs> like, you, yeah, like, like so, like, like to set it up a little bit more. You, you I, I'm interested in, the, in hearing your take on the story of like when you got to New York City, you 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 were like on a lease, in an apartment or something, but then it fell through, and you had to scramble, and then like it was kind of crazy. Like, what what was the story there? Yeah. So honestly, the real one thing that set that up was. I had been before that I was going to uh, another college to get an accounting degree because I was like worried that my music industry degree wouldn't work. And uh, New York state school was also like so cheap and, you know, I already had like a degree I had, I had had to take some extra classes. So I actually already had an accounting associate's degree. So I was like, okay, well I can try and get this internship and music recording career, but I also, I'm going to go to this other degree while I'm doing that because if that fails, I'll have this like other thing I can just go into. And uh, so I was going to Brooklyn College and I actually stayed on my friend's sister's like couch. And it was like, again, probably because of, like being around people that I actually like more, but I was like, oh, that was actually kind of fun. And then I moved with my friend into New York City. We lived in this like fucking horrible neighborhood. It was really far away from everything I had to do. My friend had trouble getting a job and he was like so depressed and just like, I was barely ever home. And then after a month, he was like, man, I'm out of money and I like have to move back home. And I was like, okay, great. I'm like going to college and working two internships. And <laughs> we just signed here at least. So I think he got us back like some of them, like he got us back like, you know, half of the money we had paid. It was like three months you have to pay. And yeah, then I just like didn't have an apartment for a week. And I was like sleeping on uh, like one person's couch. And like I slept in the recording studio a couple of times. I was very nervous about because I was like still an intern. I don't even know how. I didn't have keys. I would have had to like, I mean, they must have left me to like clean up one night or something. I don't know. I just remember I slept there like one night. I was like so terrified of getting caught. Just hilarious because I like basically lived there later. But um, <laughs> Yeah, and so I did that for a week, and then I found another place uh, just off of Craigslist. But after that week, I was like, man, that wasn't really that bad. <laughs> I was just like, you know, I was like working these internships. I had like, I mean, I had enough money to pay like the sh rent in like only the weirdest places. And so, so then I moved in this other place that was actually a squat that was uh you kind of like if you could get in with the squatters you would eventually like pay no rent because they had a bunch of rooms it was also illegal and it was also in williamsburg which is like highly desirable property and so eventually the fire department kicked us out and then i was like man i'm just not gonna get another place like fuck it what will happen but then i was working at the studio and like getting yeah you know, yeah i was just like it's like i could do this i could stay at the studio and like do the shit and I'm working like 15 hours a day anyway. Like, why not just, I'll sleep more. <laughs> I'll just sleep where I am. <laughs> I'm, and I'm always the first person there, the last person to leave. So yeah, that was, I did that. And I did that for a month and a half the first time. And then after that, I would do it. Uh, I did it two more times for six months. Wow. Yeah. I would also, I figured out that I should do it. I did the first time I did it in the, I did it in the winter, which was terrible, but after that, I would do it like in the nice months in New York. So like over the spring, summer and fall. So you could spend more time outside, like when you're not working or sleeping. Yeah. Yeah. It's also interesting. You lived on it like an urban farm in New Orleans, right? Yeah. What was that like? Uh, It was great, man. I love that place. I would. <laughs> the, the, the downfall of the urban farm was just that the dude, my friend who runs it, uh, 
wanted me to do like a work trade for him. He really wants like a work trade person to live there. And I just like felt like he was asking for too much work and it was an unconventional arrangement. And like, I was really, in, we were both really into that in the start. And I think it kind of was the downfall of that arrangement was that he just like, you know, I don't know, it was like a trailer on an urban farm. It's kind of like inconveniently located in New Orleans, but the space was really cool. And it was just like, how do you, uh, make up the value of it I always felt like he thought it was worth more than it was and I felt like it was worth less and so like I mean it's his trailer so we ended on good terms like I didn't kicked out or anything but yeah. and eventually he let me like pay rent for it which was nice and but uh yeah I was just living on a little trailer on an urban farm and I, for a while I just did work for him which was also kind of nice uh and, and you 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 rent an apartment now right you have a place? Uh yes, yeah. And you you working on buying a bus? You maybe Yeah, I am yeah, I'm working on buying a bus. Um, I don't I am I'm kind of actually plagued by the housing thing like in terms of uh like early retirement because I it's just like it's never the when you have like weird housing it's never stable and that actually is like the thing that's I realized like we were talking in our like little discussion group and people kept being like, why are you, like, worried about anything? <laughs> like, you spend so little money, <laughs> and you have, like, so much saved, and you're also, like, trying to never stop working. Like, and I realized that housing was really the reason. It's just because it's like, yeah, I have really cheap housing now, but it's in no way stable. Like, I keep being able to find it, but, like, there's no guarantee that that will actually keep going. Like, I just keep getting lucky or in these weird arrangements. And then by the end of the arrangement, it's almost always gone, like, some it started to go poorly by the end of them usually so yeah so there's like stress think, and friction involved with it yes yeah and so i think i also that's kind of why i want the buses it's like well always you know it's it's a small enough space that if i end up getting some other housing arrangement that seems good it's good but i always have my like space to fall back on and like i do want to live in it like you know full time for at least sometimes if not all the time right yeah so what is what is your uh you've talked about your theoretical lowest cost of living what is that number i mean if i could get that bus it's like i'd be down to like bike tubes pretty much <laughs> 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 i mean if i get the bus yeah uh, if i had if i had a you know a paid off house it would i guess be zero or like whatever taxes plus the thing is the other reason i like the bus is because you know, it's like if you put a bus on a piece of unoccupied land, it's not going to be in that much property taxes. Might be like you might have to deal with legality stuff, but because most people's costs, the, the the big three costs, right, are housing, transportation, and food. You just implied that your transportation costs could be bicycle tubes, which is awesome. Um, uh, the bus takes care of shelter. Uh, how does your food cost theoretically zero? That is from dumpster diving of dumpster to dove my food for like two and a half years now and yeah so that makes it zero do, do you do you ever pay for food very well i go out to eat which is to me so this is like the idea of the theoretical lowest cost of living the idea is just like okay this shit hits the fan like you're just basically you know i mean then you get into the weird part of like, oh, well, you're going to want like comfortable housing or whatever. Like you want food that tastes good, obviously. But like, you know, like what's the lowest you're like really willing to go? I mean, it's, it's still like a little bit of a fine game because like you could probably always go lower if you're really fucked. But, um, <laughs> you know, like, yeah, so it's stuff like housing and uh, it's just like, I mean, I've also just like, I have paid attention to how much money I've spent for so long. Like, it's not like, like I, I'm not, if I like couldn't go out to eat anymore, like, I mean, I'd be a little bit bummed, but it's not like it wouldn't fuck my life up in any way. Like I don't eat out that much already. So I do, I like most of my major actual expenses that I spend money on are like shit that I don't need that I just like want to do. So the theoretical lowest cost of living is like, what if you just didn't do any of that stuff because you real because you like wanted to quit your job or something or like you lost your job or something like that. Yeah. And and I can see the like, like like having that theoretical cost of living in the neighborhood of a couple of bicycle tubes is, uh, that makes you. I mean, it's like, 
you, 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 it's difficult to economically fail to the point where you can't cover a couple of bike tubes a month kind of deal. Yeah, no, you. I mean, you like at that point, you probably can't ride a bike. <laughs> like, like, yeah, but well, I, I guess uh, devil's advocate. There's one like la layer of your lifestyle, like you got you got to be physically fit enough to be able to get into a dumpster and like ride a bike around. So there's a failure mode where it's like your theoretical cost of living, if you weren't as able bodied as you are now, uh, could be higher. But I mean. Yeah, I think I mean I think that health is always in these debates is always kind of a thing you can bring in because health costs can be infinite. I mean I could have cancer tomorrow and then my entire life will change. But like I I like in my opinion, having sure having more money, like all else equal is better, but it's never equal. Like you had to get that money somehow. So like mm. you know, how much how much does having a shit ton of money like really affect your life if something terrible happens to you like it will inarguably make it better but like do you want to get eight hundred thousand dollars to just in case you fall <laughs> i don't know <laughs> it's it's a risk i don't know life is just risks like mm. it's it's certainly a risk and i could certainly like i think it's i think you feel dumb because you like did something that not everyone else is doing and it didn't work out for you and people don't really like that feeling but hmm. yeah so i agree with i agree that like i you do need to be able-bodied and like but i am able-bodied and it aside from some like i mean i work out so beside, aside from some you know actual health crisis like i don't see why i would become unable bodied enough to like jump in and out of a dumpster or ride a bike right it feels like it's within my control as much as anything is uh you are you've been one of the biggest uh proselytizers biggest evangelists for uh developers of the concept of semi-eerie what is semi-eerie okay so for me i i know i didn't like actually make up that term i like saw it somewhere else after i put it but like in my mind i like made it up <laughs> yeah well, to, to, <laughs> like, to, cl to clarify like yeah you maybe didn't invent it i mean it's in the book kind of but you, it's totally you, in the you, book, yeah. you, you you put a lot of uh work into it and did a lot of work to like develop it and and talk about it so now a lot of people are into it and can think about it and like oh this is an option whereas before it was like kind of just the standard approach that most people assume like oh you do eerie this is the way you do it um but you did a yeah, lot of work like for me i like developed it myself and then when I was like writing the initial posts about it, I was just like trying, kind of just trying to like, I don't know if cover my ass is the right word, like just get, I mean, give credit where credit was due. And I would go back and I was like, oh no, this is like, this has been talked about before, but I was just like, I was like, this is like an amazing, con this is like a breakthrough important concept that a lot of people in here need to hear and no one's talking about it. So I guess I'm the one who talked about it the most, like that was maybe my contribution, but yeah, I mean, it's kind of like to me my like little baby that like I feel like kind of uh yeah, like in a way responsible for it. Yeah, uh, totally. So what is yeah? It? <laughs> so so what it is to me, uh, and I mean, this is like totally unfair, but I I am going to use it. Uh, to me, like okay, so you could work, you could do what like I was taught to do, which is you basically, you know, you get a job at either 18 or 22 when you graduate college or whatever, grad school, whatever, like whenever you're out of college, you get a job, you work forever, you save like a little bit, and then you retire at some point. Again, is it when you're 60 or is it when you're 80? I don't know. But like, who knows? And so then, then like there's fire, which was like, okay. So instead of doing that, you kind of like condense that period into, you know, if you're going with like early retirement extreme, like you're trying to get it in the shortest possible period, but like, you're basically like, it's like, no, it's possible to like live under the amount of money you make. And it's that perhaps even desirable to do that. And then you're going to like save the rest of the money. So you just do the regular way of retiring early, but you're doing it so early that it's actually kind of like life-changing because you're not just like you know, sitting around watching TV and like riding around on cruises, you like have all this energy left in your life that you could just do whatever you wanted to, you know, you still got your kind of like working years left. So you could use that to do whatever the fuck you want. And 
to me, what's semi-eerie is like just taking any concept in between those two points. Like one is like work kind of as long as you can. And the other one is kind of like work as short as you can. And then there's to me this like entire space in between those two things that is like pretty interesting to explore. Especially because the people who invented or came up with the idea of like work as short as you can were all like pretty into their jobs, but the people who like listened to those people largely were not into their jobs. Like that the other people who invented it were kind of just like, oh fuck. Like I just kind of did this. I mean, it, not I could like when I read it, I was like, oh fuck, I like fucked up. Because like you said, like I had all the pieces, you know, and like they they're kind of the same. Like they're just like raised frugal. They got like in somehow disillusioned with what was happening, but not not so much where they were like, oh, like I don't want to go to work anymore. It's just like uh, I don't really want to spend my life like consuming all the time. And then it was like figuring out the investment component and savings component. But yeah, so like, and I I also thought of it. I mean, I was totally self serving. Like I was like, I don't really want to like kill myself at a job. I also am like trying to always figure out how to like maintain my music career, but not have to like live off of it. And so I figured out from that, but then I just like, uh, by that point I had started participating in the forum and just like, there's so many people in there. who are just like so fucking miserable, like living off of like 10% of their income and uh, with like so much money saved and just hating their jobs. And I was like, dude, like, the only place where this is like a reasonable option is here. Like you're, <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> like, just take the shit your mind out of this space for a second. Like, why are you making yourself miserable for like, just to, you know, because aside from being the fastest eerie is also the most conservative in how much you have to save, mm, yeah. uh, which I do think, which I think is smart. Cause I don't like it had much investment skill either. And like, I understand like the, that's that's part of what I like about continuing to work because you don't have to worry about that as much yeah. anymore. Um, okay, okay, so you're talking about Erie and you're talking about uh, we're we're talking about the form and how there's a lot of people who are like miserable because they're like in this little bubble. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the initial people I was just would go in their journals and be like, "Dude, what the fuck are you doing? Like, you gotta, you're like so." Just, I mean, it's like kind of you just said about reading my journal, like too, like. There, you know, now that I have a journal and write it and have it's like years back, I'm like, yeah, I don't remember what the fuck I wrote like three years ago. But right, like when you are finding out like someone's like journey, you like read their thing in a couple of days or like a week or something. And so you, it's, it's actually a lot easier to see their like patterns than probably for them because I'm just like, dude, you've been miserable for like two years. <laughs> like every post you write is about how miserable you are for two years. You want to, you're going to want to change something. And like, you have the power to change something and you're like, it's just sort of, you know, there's so much pushback against this movement and there's all this rhetoric about like, how, like the reasons why, the same reasons why you can actually pull it off and people are pulling it off are the same reasons why you don't have to make it all the way to the thing. It's like, the number you're saving towards is an illusion. Like, it'll never be the right number like you can't no it's unknowable it'll never be safe there'll always be a reason to get more like i and like not to discourage people from doing it that way if that's what they're doing actually that's something i i've always wanted to be really clear about like i don't be i don't ever mean to discourage people from doing that path if that path is if they're like the other people and they're like yeah my job's not that bad you know like i'll just work full time i have a pretty fulfilling life i just see the point of like I see the point. I see some benefit from doing this, you know, like, that's great. Like, honestly, if I could, if I figured this out when I was like 22 and worked in the music industry, I probably would have just worked in the music industry for like 15 years or something and then be like out like now and done it that way. But like, I had already gone into jobs that I didn't like because I didn't, because I didn't want to do that job for like 50 years, which I assumed was the only option. Right. So like, I still like the option that you can do whatever a job for like five to 15 years you know, like, if you like your job, like, fucking don't do this shit. It's harder. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, well, well, what's, why is it harder? Uh, it's harder just because you have to figure out, 
like finding part time work can be hard. Uh, it's just easy. I don't. Know. You're like when you do the regular fire ere way. It's just like you're just taking the knowledge that you are already the thing you are already supposed to do, and kind of like you're manipulating things that are like totally within your control. You don't have to figure out. You don't really have to figure out other stuff. I, there is, I think, there is actually some like slight dangers in doing it that way. But like, if I was on a path, I always think it's easier. It's better to do like just the thing that you already know that you're doing if it's working for you, and the thing that everyone else is doing. Like, I don't like doing the thing everyone else is doing, but like, so I do a lot of shit that is not the normal way, and like, it's fucking harder. <laughs> it's <laughs> like it's easier to do it the way you were raised to do it by, and like your culture tells you to do it. It's just like easier to stay on that path if that path isn't working for you by all means like it's really important to know that there's options to get off of it but if it's working for you like just do it and uh i mean i appreciate if people don't like criticize people who don't do it that way and like fear monger them but other than that like yeah just do it the easier way yeah now you've you've uh a concept in early retirement is sequence of returns risk which is let's say like you retire at the top of market and then there's a there's a big dump but you have to draw down from your capital, uh, and then as it recovers, you have way less principal. So uh, you now don't have enough money to be retired for the rest of your life, like you assumed you would. That is one of the things that early retirees, you know, have to watch out for. You talk about um, well, it's interesting that semi eatery kind of like negates that, which is interesting. But also, you talk about sequence of retirement risk. I think is the term you use for it. Am I, yeah. Do I have that right? Yeah. What What's that? Uh, again, this is just something I like made up one day and haven't thought a ton about since then, but if I'm recalling what I wrote about it correctly, uh, to me, the much bigger risk, well, okay, to talk about this, I have to also kind of like criticize a weird assumption in the early retirement movement, which is that like, and this is also like semi-eerie makes you do this but like it's somehow it seems a failure if you like have to go back to work and a lot of people put a lot of effort into like doing all these com these like forecast calculations which are again like you never know if they're right or not but they'll, they'll like really use this as like advanced statistics to do these forecasts and it's like okay but what if you were just willing to make like three thousand dollars twice like, at the exact right time like it would solve a lot of your fucking problems so so yeah i don't like the sequence of returns risk is like i believe it's from actual retirement when you're like too old to work is yeah. it's more of a problem because it's like the uh, and I, maybe that's the fear in early retirement is that you've been out of work for too long to get another job but yeah so, but what I think is the bigger risk for that, like I see people do is just staying in their jobs for too long. And again, this is like people who really dislike their jobs because and I, there are, I know there is like, I guess I should maybe read the like failure, Mr. Money mustache thing or something. I know there are people who early retire and it doesn't work out for them, but like the, all the people I've ever heard about and interact with are people who end up with like way more money than they need it. I don't know that they're necessarily like unhappy with that outcome. That might have been like even a desired outcome, but like right. they end up with more money than they're ever going to use. And uh, again, if you kind of liked your job and like you were just like rounding out that portion of your life to get that money, like fuck it, like who cares? But like if you're like, this is the risk is that you're just really suffering for like <laughs> those last three years, which are going to be the worst, most grinding years. You already know that you can get out. You've worked so hard. And you're just so focused on like padding your shit that it's like you don't explore other options uh, or just like take the fucking leap and yeah. do it and do what you want to do. And, it, and it's not like if like when you finally retire uh, and if the last few years or whatever were really awful for you, it's not like you're you're good now because you don't work anymore. It's like the deeper into a hole you get, the more you have to recover and like heal from whatever burnout uh like stress is bad for people you know speaking of health and like being but you know bodily able for stuff that you get, yeah i don't know so I, was trying to, I was trying to remember what i wrote in the original thing where i talked about <laughs> it but like throwing that out or like i don't remember if i talked about it or not, i totally agree like uh and the longer i've been like i mean i'm kind of retired like i really work very little uh it is like i still 
I still like do there is a component of semi year or two that I've done it for a number of years where it is like I do have like work related stress. Like I had to work today, I didn't want to, I had to go to bed earlier than I wanted to last night, I was pissed off about it. But like I also was out of work by fucking nine AM this morning. <laughs> and I don't know, like it's like I don't know, but it's not it's not total freedom. And like if I needed less money, like if I was already retired and was just doing this job for like the reasons I've talked about that I like having a job, like I wouldn't do that. Or I could just tell my boss to fuck off, but I like don't. I want to like stay in good standing to keep like some of the money flowing. So there is a trade off there. But sure. the longer I've done it, uh, yeah, like it's hard. Like okay, this is fucking like Mr. Money Mustache and Jacob both. Like they're so good at figuring out what they want to do. Like I don't understand how. Like it's so like my fr- uh, I have a friend who is like not into this at all. Uh, she's just like taking a sabbatical from work and she was talking to me she's like man like i thought i'd be at the gym every day but like i'm not i'm like yeah i know it's hard because like when you're at work and you waste time you're like who gives a fuck like i do very little actual work at my job like most of the time i'm just reading but it's like on someone else's time so who cares like any possible personal gain i get from that time i feel like i'm winning when you're your own master of your own time it's like fuck it's hard (laughs) but you get really upset with yourself if you don't like and you don't it's like, are you giving yourself enough rest? Are you like getting the stuff done you want to do? Managing how much stuff you can actually get done. It's a, in my experience it takes years to figure out. Like I've not done figuring it out, and I feel like certainly for a few years I was like very frustrated by it. And well, uh, yeah, it's it just takes like time. And I think if you work a job and you think you're going to quit and it's just going to be like your life will be fine, but you didn't figure out what you're going to do like yeah it's not a great idea yeah yeah like except somehow for jacob and mr money mustache who immediately knew everything they wanted to do and it worked out perfectly <laughs> or at least that's know. the way it seems yeah the hardest fucking part the hardest part <laughs> is the time, which is like so if you're <laughs> but, yeah yeah you know, like, i wish they i wish what i i don't know i don't know if there's a, there's so many fireballs that was there like one of them who talks about the, that like it's actually much harder <laughs> to to not have someone telling you what to do like that the absence of that is difficult i don't know that to me is actually the hardest part yeah well you know i've i've there's so so one of the arguments for traditional fire approach which is save up as much money as you can as quickly as possible and then you know it can compound over time uh like it is more efficient to save quickly than later just because of the math of compounding interest right um but you can kind of use the concept of compounding in other domains other than just financial, uh, like, like time spent figuring your life out in other domains can like compound. Like if you wait until 10 years from now to start figuring out how you're going to be your own boss, how you're going to uh, manage your own time when you have absolute freedom, like then from there, that's, that's now your, your, your time zero. And it's going to take a long time as you're saying to like, figure life out unless you're one of these people who's just like oh yeah i'm gonna do this this and this or they may maybe they don't know exactly what they're gonna do but they don't seem to have anxiety about that process whereas a lot of people do i certainly do you do um and other people have written about it so it's like one of the beauties to me is like you can start you can start that process much earlier uh in your life and find yourself maybe at a place that has less anxiety you figure yourself out more sooner um and yeah you're leaving some efficient or like a savings efficiency on the table but there's more to it than just the money yeah i've also found that just the for me just going to work actually helps in the process of figuring out what i'm doing because it's like mm. nice to go accomplish something that i don't am not in charge of for like a small amount of time in fact when i was more working like one to two days a week uh yeah, I was like, uh, even though I I like what I, I like the just by moving places where I worked, it got like I enjoy my job a little bit more now. But like, yeah, I didn't even like it. <laughs> like I was like going to do something I didn't like to do. But I like it actually worked in my process of doing shit. Like, because it like it forces you to take time off. But even when you if you when you're taking time off, you're actually still responsible for like having your own fun or whatever. In a way, it's not it's not like unimportant to take time off when if you're like working on your own projects, but like 
you're still in charge. Like, it's just kind of nice to go. Uh, I mean, I guess maybe don't be an executive if this is how it is for you, but it's, it's nice. Like I just go, I'm responsible for like my little portion of the thing. I work on a small team. Like I don't even care that much about my job. Like I don't feel like I really do that much in my job and it's not like fulfilling in any way, but it's just like, I still go and a thing happens at work and then I leave and it's like done and we did it and I don't have to be responsible for every single piece of it. And yeah, just doing that like one or like one and like then going there for another short day a week, like, I don't know, you know, it's, you get into this weird place of like trying to, what's the exact perfect amount <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that you right. can fucking <laughs> to work, to not work. But uh, yeah, I found it really helpful. Like three days is a little too much uh, in that it just takes up a little too much space. This is, I don't know, maybe it seems silly to talk about this, but this is something that, like, this is actually a huge pushback against semi-eerie, and I'm like, have you tried working two days a week? Like, it's different. Like, in the way that, like, go having the weekend helps you in your job, because you take a little space, and you come back fresh on Monday, like, having the little work vacation from your own shit, like, I found really helps refocus mm -hmm. you in your own shit. Mm -hmm. But there I is, like, very quickly, it does also become, like, too much. Or it's easy to... It's easy yeah. to make it be too much or like get sucked back into work bullshit. But yeah, I don't I, know. I, 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 I think it is important. Like what that small amount of time work is like you, you, this, this your gig where you don't have any real responsibilities. Like there's nothing for you to do or think about when you're not there. Sounds amazing. I don't think I've ever experienced anything like that. Uh, I, cause the, the last year when I worked, I worked one day a week. Eight, eight hours a week really is, is what it was and it was not one-fifth of the stress and like mental attention as my full-time as when i was working full-time it was half or something like that you know but i was getting paid a fifth so it's like that didn't work out but that's because i was i was like responsible for team and projects and I, you know, like there's a lot of stuff that like would come back on me i couldn't really set it down so uh, that was that was not an ideal uh, semi-eerie uh, gig for me, but um, when it's the right thing, I think, yeah, I can say that could be quite nice. Yeah, no, it's nice. Uh, I, yeah, I don't know. I've never worked. I've never really worked at a job where that like wasn't true, but which is weird. I know because I get, I've always done something where like the word like tech is in the job title at least in some iteration of it so I think that is actually the key oh tech <laughs> like, yeah like I go I do the technical you know the like it's not really even what my definition of the word technical would be but I'd go and I'd fuck around with the wires and then like <laughs> the, whatever whatever the thing we're doing like there's always some event happening and then the event will eventually end or we stop doing it for the day and it's over and you leave and like i mean my job now it's really not possible to like think about it it's like it's like totally over when it's over and there's no real growth or change in it so which is t very boring but yeah you do it is a good like you can totally leave it there like you almost are forced to and uh but you know like recording studio you can maybe be like thinking about it's more of a creative process so you could be thinking about something but like realistically you go there you set up the microphones you like record the people you talk to the people and like it goes forever but like yeah at the end of the day like once the people leave you're not recording people anymore and you can't and it's over right right hmm. and and just, just to clarify your current job has nothing to do with music or sound engineering or anything like that it's correct it does thing. yeah just because of the tech aspect of it, it actually is like the skill set of sound engineering, I use some of the same skills, but oh, it has nothing has nothing to do with it at all. Yeah. So like wire manipulation. Um and and so like one of the other things that you spend a lot of time with, like obviously you're still super involved with music. Um and semi allows you to spend a lot of time on this on your music passion if that's the right word, endeavor that you want to be doing for the rest of your life, right? Yeah, and that was, you know, I mean, that's kind of always been what I was trying to figure out. And I think ultimately why this spoke to me so loudly and why I also figured out the other things because I wasn't necessarily looking for, well, first of all, going into music, I just like knew again that it was emphasized to me that it was not like you're like giving up the life of like money that you could have if you just 
like you know i was always good at school so like i could have done some like engineering other like regular engineering thing uh or like some business thing or something and it's just like you know you're not going that route you're going this like harder route so i was just kind of assumed it would be poor forever and like was kind of prepared for that which helped with the frugality (laughs) aspect too (laughs) and uh yeah so that that plus like always needing a bunch of free time to work on music is like i think why mr money mustache appealed to me i was like oh look look at all this free time i could gain and then i was like well i don't really want to give up working on music for even five years that's what kind of why i'm always like yeah i don't know like eight months maybe i would fucking grind it out like it, my time frame is very short how much i'm willing to like really work and that's part of the reasons because i'm like giving up all this shit doing all this shit that i want to do so mm. and like yeah it's nice it is like also kind of a demanding career in its own way that in some ways is on like it doesn't have like the monetary reward it doesn't always work out it can be frustrating but yeah that is like it's sort of been my i think it's a bigger reason of why i got into this and i'm not sure I'm really thankful that I actually pursued it, even though it's like emphasized to me what a bad idea it was. <laughs> well, because you you started a, a record label, right? Yeah. Yes. And what is, I so I've I know like basically nothing about the music industry. What does that mean? Like, what do you do? I it doesn't say. actually almost mean anything. <laughs> it means that I said I started a record label. That's what it means. Uh, for me, <laughs> well, I started I started that record label because I was. Uh, I had all of the studio gear from saving more money when I was uh, working in the studio and I just had it in my house. I would kind of like work on music by myself. Uh, at that point, I was like mostly playing in this one band it was probably my main relationship to music. And uh, then I made a couple of records with a friend that I played on a lot and we played a couple of shows. And then I made a couple of other records for other friends. And I got us, I got a couple of them, uh, these like really minor publishing deals that weren't even guaranteed to make money. And they, everyone kind of like freaked out on me. <laughs> I was just like, like, I, I was also like, you know, I, I had, I had wanted to do sound engineering as a career, but sound engineering, in my opinion, is not, it can be fun enough to do for not for money, but it's not really usually that fun. So I was like, I, you know, I was just like, okay, I haven't worked in a studio in like five or six years at this point. I don't really want to go back to doing that every day unless I could somehow f- magically find a 30 hour studio job, which doesn't really exist. Uh, I have all this gear, like there's weird records that I want to see get made, but I don't really want to put a ton of time into them. And also I would like, after I put all this effort into making this record for free, if I also then get us a way to make money off of it or potential money if these people don't like freak out on me. And so I just contacted a lawyer and got him to drop a contract where like, uh, I can, I can like get publishing deals for records that I make, which you can't do if you just make the record legally. And then on top of that, something that we'd kind of always done because I've been making records and like in college, we made a lot of like records for like pretty cheap. And so another thing that a record label traditionally does is like put your music out, but in 2023, where everyone streams it, it's actually pretty easy to put your music out yourself. And yet people, I mean, it's a pain in the dick. I've done it. I've done it myself. <laughs> I actually, actually I've outsourced this in my label. Uh, and I'm very thankful to the person who does it because it sucks, but it takes like, it's, it takes, if you don't do it that often, it takes maybe the better part of an afternoon. Uh, and you have to pay a little bit of money, but not certainly an affordable amount for almost anyone. And then your music, it will be on all these streaming services. So we do that. Uh, we have not done a physical release yet. We've like talked about doing physical releases, which would be a more traditional record label thing. So like the normal thing a record label does actually is just finance your record. But we're kind of, there's like Motown used to own a recording studio. And so our idea, once we got the studio, is like, okay, we like do all the records ourselves and then we release them and we like get these certain legal rights. And like, uh, we, there's a couple of like money-making schemes in there, but when I started it, I was very clear with myself and I was clear to my partners, like the point of this isn't to make money. It's to like put out weird records that we want to see made that like no one else is willing to make that like, we just happen to have the means to make. So that's the inspiration behind it. 
and we've it's been going. We have not made anything new since we started it, but uh, I also had this like backlog of shit that I just didn't. I was kind of like overwhelmed by dealing with that was had taken a lot of time to make and just like needed. I needed so I needed someone's help and someone to push me to like get it out there into the world. And so, yeah, I think we've actually no. There's still like one or two things. We had, all of the major shit that I was really excited about putting out is out. And there's like one or two songs that are actually my stuff that it's not I haven't put out yet. That's still in my back catalog. But then the other guys brought other stuff too. So we have like all this other shit that I didn't even have to. Uh, it's great. I'm very pleased. <laughs> <laughs> it's, great. it's 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 taken all like a life beyond me that I'm really happy about. It's the first project I've ever started actually that like has done that, which has been nice. Like the other few guys I work with really do a lot of work and. Uh, bring a lot to the table and yeah i'm so i actually feel like i'm the person who's like slacking so <laughs> which is nice <laughs> right on. um what other kind of um uh, activities do you get up to in your semi-eerie retirement life uh well actually i want to say let me say one more thing about music first and yeah, yeah. answer that question uh eerie also helped me with uh, something it kind of felt me like I'd kind of, by the time that I got really into maybe not fire, but certainly like, uh, really into like the more eerie stuff, which to me is like so much more than just the early retirement aspect. Totally. Like I wasn't really trying to have a career in the music industry, but I still, just because I tried to do it before and, you know, when I was a kid, I like wanted to be a rock star. Like I kind of like harbored something and it, it, helped, it just helped me balance out. Like there's something, there's this kind of like tragedy that happens with musicians. And this is why I think music is like not really that good of a choice for most people because like, all right, I'm 36 now. And like, like when you're 26, it's kind of cool to be a musician and not make money and just be like sleazy. But by the time you're 36, that is way less cool. <laughs> and like, <laughs> both, a lot, like a lot of the musicians I know who are passionate about music have just, are kind of like grinding it out as musicians, which is not a great way to make money. And like, mm. I don't know. A t there's a couple of people. New Orleans also has like a very is very special because it's possible to be a musician here. It's a cheap place to live. There are a lot of in New Orleans gigs. You don't have to be internationally famous. You can be just locally famous and have a pretty good career. So the people at the top of the New Orleans music scene, I don't know. I like I work with some of them occasionally doing sound for them, like live sound, but I don't know them very well. They seem to be relatively happy and like fulfilled in their music career, which is like so rare. And they also lead like regular people lives for the most part. But like, I know a lot of the people who play in their bands are like grinding it out, you know, getting paid. Like it's not a terrible life, but it's like, yeah, I mean, it sucks when you're like 26, everyone's life is like, it's like, uh, maybe the guy who works at the finance job is making like twice as much money as you, but now that guy's making like fucking four times as much money as you. And it's like, it's not as fun to be doing your 9 millionth gig as it was to do your 900th gig or whatever. But hmm. so Eerie for me really helped put it into perspective, like, because there's sort of this thing in the music industry that you're either kind of this like total loser, amateur, or you have to like try to make it your career, which is like frustrating at almost every possible level. Like it kind of sucks to be a touring musician. Like, it's awesome for a little bit, but you're on tour all the time. <laughs> like, your life is kind of fucked. Yeah. Like, some people really, there's people out there who really love it for sure. But, like, a lot, I know a lot of people who tour who are kind of like, yeah, uh, it's kind of awesome, but it's frustrating. Again, it becomes your whole life. And, like, right. you have to build your life around that. And then, so, so they, I just, like, eerie kind of, like, helps me, like, unpack things that seem to be, like, it's like, well, you could either devote your entire life to this, probably be frustrated, or even if you're successful, it like never quite is unfrustrating. Or you could be this like amateur. Uh, it's kind of helped me find the space like in between those things where I was like, no, I've gotten to play like super awesome gigs to like more people than I ever thought I'd play with. Like I, I again, I achieved the goal that I had when I was fucking like 16. It's just mm. like the goalposts move after that naturally, and some of that's okay. Like I would like to still play a bigger gig than I played, but it's like. If I don't play a bigger gig than I've ever played in my life right now, like I'm okay with that. I still mm. feel like fulfilled, and I don't know that I would have found that. I didn't. It was. It's hard to it's just hard to see that extra space without thinking about the weird relationship we have with work and consumerism and how like like did I start 
making music because I wanted to make a bunch of money off of it? No. And then like, yes, as you become older, you realize the like value of making money from the thing you're doing, but it's like, it beca- then it becomes too overwhelming. And it's like, there is actually a space in between only doing it for money or just doing it because you love it or just doing it because mm-hmm. like you can't make money, you know? And I don't think I would have found that. Like Eerie really helped me find that. And that's, that's been really nice since I figured that out because I don't, I'm way less stressed out if I'm not doing music stuff or I feel like some aspect of my music like career isn't going well. It's like, fuck, I don't care anymore. <laughs> like mm-hmm. I've done a bunch of stuff. I'm going to keep doing stuff. Like I want it to be as successful as possible, but if it's not successful in a traditional sense or if it doesn't, you know, I've seen the people at the top of the music industry. They always, the person at the very top of the music industry is concerned with staying at the top and everyone else is concerned with getting to the top. Mm-hmm. And it's like, ugh. Why? That sucks. <laughs> you have like a hundred hit songs. Who fucking cares? So, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's been it's just nice to get out of that. It's very difficult to talk to people about it though because no, almost no other musician thinks of that in that well, capacity. Like most of them are frustrated, and then and then the people who aren't frustrated are like frustrated by the success. So, well, I have I, I, the, 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 I actually want to ask that as a follow up question. Like, have you talked to? <laughs> You talk about semi eerie on the on the eerie forums, and part of your app uh, of your audience is the people who are trying to like trad eerie or trad fire really quickly, and you're like, hey, you know, there's there, there might be a better way if, if it's a good fit for you. But then, like, have you talked about the ideas with musician friends and people you know, and like, hey, have you talked about like eerie strategy with people, and how those how have those conversations gone? No, I don't talk about it with people who don't do it because they fucking hate it. Why? description i've seen from jacob is that like a lot of like people in the simplicity movement which these people aren't really but they're in that like hippie way are like yeah. it's difficult to convince them to save money and they're kind of that way yeah. and they're all you know they're also like musicians they tend to be like more live in the moment people like i have a tendency like to be if i'm hanging out with my nerd friends i'm like the coolest one if i hang out with my cool friends i'm like the nerdiest one so you know not a lot of my musician friends are like they're mostly just trying to get by and like not really thinking about the future and uh I mean, if you're just like, hey, you could say, people also don't like generally like to get out of the frustrations that they have. Like, people kind of like to complain about the shit they already complain about. Mm-hmm. And I find it's pretty rare to find someone who doesn't, it has a complaint. And if you like provide them a way to get out of that, that they're like, oh, thanks. They're usually like, no, that's impossible. <laughs> Otherwise, I would have done it already. Yeah. I... So, yeah, musicians like to complain about how broke they are. And uh, like, if, mm-hmm. if I find someone who I think I can, put some piece of advice that will help them in their ear i do but those instances are pretty rare and i definitely do not bring it up just like out of blue um do do, yeah. do any of your friends like see how you're not struggling like you're not broke and how like your life is running smooth if you present that way which maybe you maybe you don't and then ask questions are they like hey why aren't you struggling or like in general they're like kind of jealous <laughs> me, but yeah I don't. I haven't seen it translate into like how could you do this. I also do. It's it's rare to couple the. I have achieved like a kind of rarity, and this is why semi year you can be hard to of like I have a you know like professional job that pays really well that I'm able to work very little, and by the time I got it, I was already so used to being broke that I just didn't like have any lifestyle inflation, and so I think a lot of them because most of my musician friends don't have. Or if a few of them have full time jobs, they hate, and then most of them are still like service industry jobs. So I think in their mind, I think that is usually the easy explanation mm-hmm. to them. It's like, oh, well, you have a better job than I do, which is not untrue. So, yeah, I think to, to a lot of them, that is the uh, solution. I also don't. <laughs> this is the most interesting eerie part. Is like the musicians. And my friends who have a lot of money and me, like, we don't actually lead that different lives. Like, maybe how much we work or how much we enjoy our work is different. Or, like, some anxiety about money stuff. But, yeah, we, like, kind of all do the same shit. Like, my friend who owns a coffee shop and my friends who are baristas don't. Like, their thought process is maybe is different. But the shit they actually do day to day, I'm like, you guys are doing the same shit. Like. Huh. So, I don't know. I don't. I guess. I'm saying that because I don't know that my life is so obviously different. 
God, than everyone yeah. else is. And also, it's not an, it's not New Orleans is not a nine to five city. It's a very like service industry, weird job, odd job city. So it's not that weird that I'm not at work at a certain time. Sure. You, you've written for about. You you have claimed that in certain situations, semi eerie despite being a less efficient way to save money because you're not compounding as much as early, uh, is a less risky approach than like white knuckling to FI. Okay. Uh, that is because you continue to earn income through a job. And I don't think that having a hole in your resume is a big deal as like everyone seems to think it is, but it is like, it's easier to find work when you have work. It's always easier to get shit when you already have it. I find, and uh, and also like if you're if you're totally unused to working. I mean, this is I've never like I haven't not worked for that long ever. But I mean, I just, I imagine if you haven't worked for like five years, and you and then before that you only work like two full time jobs. It might be hard to like go back and get into the mindset of work. Maybe uh, at any rate, I just think continuing to work is a good way to keep income coming in and that just adds an entire component to your money earning portfolio that is not investment related and while it could be argued that it's correlated to you know like sure job market side of the stock market like i don't know yeah <laughs> you know many people are just like like can you really not get a job you like do you see these motherfuckers outside? Like they can't do anything. <laughs> like you got, you like went to college, you got a high paying job. You fucking saved all this money and retired when you were like 30. And now you're like, can't get a fucking job as a cashier at Walmart. Or something. <laughs> I don't know. I don't buy it. Like, uh, if, if there's, you know, again, like if there's some major economic downturn, like a re emergence of the great depression, even that that's, I just like, I feel like people who do this are like pretty like ingenious and you know they can they're capable of changing i've seen i i, I don't know what the component is between because i see people who are like totally insane that are constantly employed and i see these people who seem very capable and nice who cannot get a job to save their lives i don't know what the mm. i can always get jobs so i don't know i don't know what the magic formula is but uh, yeah, to me, it adds the sort of like fail safe to it. It's not actually a fail safe. Like, you can't always get a job. You can get fired from your job. It's not, it's, you know, everything has risks to it. But the way I look at it, it's an uncorrelated thing. It's also just you get to keep doing the thing that you were probably trained to do that makes sense. I'm kind of going back to what I said, like, a, probably like an hour ago now or something. But like, just keep doing the thing you know how to do, you know, like do the easier path. Like you get to stay in that a little bit. Like, I don't know how to fucking get investment returns. Like my parents aren't investment bankers. They are not good at investing. They are just like normal people at investing. Most people don't know how to do it. And, uh, so like, I mean, that's, that, uh, that's was another reason I even thought of semi eerie and has always been my qualm with the fire movement and like the like simple math. It's like, dude, like five percent investment returns are no way guaranteed. Like I know that was one of the reasons I I I found the forum because I I was looking for someone who didn't like index investing because again it was just like this always goes up and I was like nothing always goes up mm -hmm. and I was just like I was just like after I started saving a little bit of money and I like finally had an amount of money that I was like I don't I will be pissed if I lose this amount you know I don't want to like lose half this amount of money finally like uh. I was like, I don't know about this index investing. It seems like a weak part of the strategy. So like, just like, you know, Jacob is not like in then it's an index investing camp only. So that was one. And I was also just like bored of fire stuff because it's actually like relatively easy to figure out, but, uh, or not easy to figure out, but like once, you know, once, it's not that deep a concept once you have been obsessed with it for like a year or two. Right. But yeah, so uh, I just I find the investment component of Erie like very flimsy, and it does from reading people on the forum. It doesn't seem like it's like Jacob again. Somehow he's just like figured it out in like a couple of years, and I'm just like, I am like, dude, I don't know how the fuck you did this. Like it's so, it seems so risky and complicated, and I don't know how. I mean, I've been trying to figure it out for years now. Like I haven't put as much like. Uh, effort into like reading all that shit that he did but yeah i don't know i don't, it's just uh to me it's kind of a much riskier thing to like be like well i don't really know how 
this works and it doesn't make sense to me, but I will make all my income from it for the rest of my life. <laughs> I really like that component of it. So yeah. Yeah. That's why I like the continuing to make some money. And then there's also the, like the sequence of return thing you mentioned earlier, which is, it helps mitigate that because that I think also if you were a really savvy investor, there's probably a uh, investment strategy way. Like there's probably a higher level, if you're into, if you're good at investing and like thinking in that mindset and seeing the correlations of like jobs and uh, that kind of stuff mm -hmm. and like knowing how much income you can make and good at manipulating that, you know, if you're like really got all these things firing, I think there's a more advanced way of doing it where I'm doing it, where it does, it just adds another component to your portfolio. It adds like another kind of uncorrelated asset to your portfolio. And, you know, if you, if you can figure out how correlated that is, like you're even further ahead. Uh, this is like this podcast is targeted at like an ERE audience, right? For the most part, or yeah. kind of okay, yeah. So totally. can I talk about like uh, the like Wheaton level stuff? Yeah, yeah, go for or it. Or no, okay. <laughs> so <laughs> well, so to me, to me, there's a huge if if you're familiar with it, there's a huge difference between like, and I've talked about this before. It's like a huge difference between like five and six. You sort of have to like change uh, modes. And one, uh, I guess, if I can summarize it, I feel like five is sort of the top of your like savings thing. And then six in my mind is like sort of what happens after you're done saving and like, or like that's like once you cross over that line, that's how your mind changes. And uh, so I found that semi year is really great for getting out of like the five mindset into the six mindset much faster mm -hmm. because you get, you get all the extra time. And if you don't have the time, it's very appealing to just try and uh, optimize saving and that have be like obsessed with that. But if you have more free time, you like have to fill that time with something and you, I guess you can just like have it be leisure time, but uh, I don't really like doing that. <laughs> I like do a bunch of other shit. Uh, the music shit takes up a huge amount of time, but uh, I also, so I started, I used actually the like, I try to use like a kind of like an eerie thing to like figure out extra shit to do. Cause I used to, when I was really into my job, I was, was into trying not to do anything outside of like music at all. So I like really didn't have that many skills. And then after I quit my music industry job, I like really was into cooking, which is a great, was very lucky. That I, I don't know why I wanted that one so much, but I did. So I got it. I've been into cooking. So cooking is one thing that I really like. It's also kind of like behind music, almost like a lifelong passion. Uh, mm. And then also something you just kind of need to do to stay alive. So <laughs> I don't, I, 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 I felt kind of stuck on cooking for a while, actually. So I don't know if I'm like putting a ton of effort into uh, improving in cooking, but occasionally I'll like try a new dish or a new technique. So I'm like kind of, I do work on that. And then also like if you cook all your own meals, I'm not, I don't focus on being a super fast cook. So, you know, I probably spend an hour or two in cooking a day. Uh, also like working out, uh, I, yeah, I run and then I do some like body weight stuff, uh, actually that you suggested. And yeah, so that ends up taking up like, I saw someone else post about this. Like, so long ago. they're like, I don't know how the fuck people are like feeding themselves and working out with these full-time shops. <laughs> like I don't, <laughs> man. it's like, <laughs> it's like that shit. You know, it only takes a couple of hours, but then you have to like for getting prepared to do it, and you like fuck around on it for you don't you're not always the most efficient at it, and all this. Yeah, that's uh, that that was taking a lot of time. And then aside from that, like uh, I try to do some like gardening stuff. Uh, I'm doing. I, I'm really got like obsessed with like fashion stuff, and uh, so I got really into suits, which you know. And so like I got, I figured out how to thrift suits then no one likes the suits you can thrift because you can get really nice suits but they're like boring looking and you look like a stockbroker so i started stenciling them and i've i've been doing all this like i have so many like iterations of learning to stencil and i finally got my like stenciling process down so i like kind of spend a fair amount of time stenciling suits every day uh it's also a good like it's nice because it's like not physically exerting but you're you've to it's moving and uh, it's just uses different skills than music. So it's, it's a good, I'll like write a, be working on a song or a mix and then I'll go over and stencil and then I'll go back and forth a lot. Cool. Um, yeah, I mean, I have like a whole list of things I'm trying to do. Like I'd like to get better photography. Like it's, I don't have enough time. And there's like not, that's there's not enough fucking time to do all the interesting stuff there is to do for free. That's what I learned. <laughs> and then like, you know, I have a pretty active social life. 
play in bands still like there's just not there's not enough time to do all the to pursue all of my interests ever i have to like really ratchet it down oh i've also been learning how to computer program uh, i would oh. like to do more writing which i don't do i'm interested in learning about like foraging and like more plant stuff uh yeah be cool to learn some bicycle maintenance so i never run out of stuff to do like i can always i always have like a project or activity that is the thing like figuring out how to streamline those and like get other people involved in those to the degree that i want them to is probably like my next challenge what do you mean uh, get other people involved in this yeah just a lot of i am like only slightly introverted but i am introverted and i tend towards doing stuff alone at first just because it's so much easier than involving other people so i tend to pick activities where i control everything and again then again you're in charge of every component and it would just be nice to do like a lot of the like there's no reason i could stencil suits with my friends i just don't do it and uh you know i could do like there's like crafting nights that i'm invited to that i never go to where i could learn better techniques too sure. so it's just like that and i also do i learn really good from there's a point in the learning process for me which is a lot of it where i like learn really well from like working with someone who's like a fair amount better than me at stuff so just being able to like go to things with people who like do crafting shit more or like do whatever i'm just starting out at on a more advanced level like hmm. yeah just like involving other people it's also i don't know it's boring <laughs> you should buy yourself it's nice i want some of the alone time but I'm, i know that i tend towards spending too much time alone and doing too much stuff on myself and trying to do too much for myself so that's why involving other people would be nice mm, got it yeah um yeah I, I followed your suit projects uh with interest um and i i've been thinking and writing about um skill acquisition recently um and i wondered if you had any thoughts on skill acquisition um in terms of process like how do you approach it like do you set are you more goal oriented or are you more process oriented? Like, how do you break it down? I mean, you've already got insights. Like it's, uh, you find it really useful to find someone who's better at it than you and like hang out with them and work with them. So do you have any other thoughts on, um, like being, uh, efficient or efficacious when it comes to skill, skill acquisition? Uh, I'm not very efficient on skill acquisition because I don't, really like being efficient uh there's i feel like efficiency is something that to me becomes necessary once you kind of don't want to do something anymore a little bit uh there, and there's not that you would be totally inefficient if you did it but like for me a lot of the fun in life is just kind of like fucking around and thinking about stuff and exploring it and like once the part it could even just be it doesn't have to be a whole activity that you become efficient at like maybe you just make part of it efficient but like you're kind of done fucking around on that part like that's why you make it efficient you're like okay well it's this isn't that fun anymore so mm -hmm. i'm going to uh like how can i do this faster like uh, i'm looking at a suit across the table that i'm painting a bunch of f's on and like the first row of f's is pretty fun to figure out i imagine the second row will be okay i'm sure by like the seventh row of them i'll be like oh my god how can i make this go faster <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah i don't know it's not like uh so i don't like i'm not trying to do that and, and as inefficiently as possible but i like very much like fucking around so i mm. don't i don't like if i try and start out with efficiency as the main thing i'm not gonna really like like something that much so uh, okay so, and, so 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 way to rephrase the question is is that how do you optimize for fucking around <laughs> Or is that like that's that is a, that, okay? That's a much more challenging. Question. That's something that I do find challenging. That's a challenge I do accept. Uh, <laughs> the uh, uh, kind of like you just wake up and do whatever you feel like doing. But for me, for me, I found that will condense down to. So I try and be process oriented, but it's because I am a little bit actually goal oriented. And so, like, if I don't see something like leading towards a goal, I don't like it. And sometimes I can be like over and like get too far into a detail and end up spending too much time, like in a way kind of like optimizing it. And then I get bored and frustrated and I'm like, oh, why this isn't even fun. Why am I playing drum paradiddles for four hours a day? Like I just wanted to fucking play drums in a band. This is not bad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, I mean, and that's kind of like, that's in a way how I am inefficient though. Like I will, so I like to go down the rabbit hole, but so how I do it is I just like wake up 
Um, I do sometimes to varying degrees if I'm trying to do something that I feel this is, this is mostly like a music related thing, but it can be project related too. If I, if I have like the, the goal in sight, I will kind of try to like, be like, okay, well, you're going to do this for like X amount of time every day. And then I'll usually do that for a bit and have to kind of go back and be like, well, you're not doing that anymore because now you hate it. But, uh, yeah. So yeah, either by either my two, I guess my two methods are just doing whatever, trying to leave myself time to do whatever I feel like and be like, this is the time for personal projects or be like you were doing, you know, like, I mean, you know, I like try to run every day. So it's like, okay, well, you're going to run today. I don't necessarily know when it tends to be in the late afternoon, but like at some point you're going to run, uh, you know, I like that. Yeah, well, I'm off of my, like, I do. I like to have a little bit of a routine. I'm like off of my routine. So it's just working at jazz fest, but, uh, normally I try and play drums for like five minutes a day. I try and at least like touch a guitar every day. Like I might end up writing most of the music on like a keyboard or something, but like, those are my two instruments that like, I'd need to like play to keep my skills up. So, so yeah, it depends. It depends on what the thing is, but yeah, that's it. And that I, I find this challenging. Like I'm always trying to invent new ways to both get shit done and make it be fun. So that's, it's a constant challenge. I'm constantly, I'm constantly <laughs> manipulating these factors. I've not found the answer yet. I've not yeah. found the key. I've not found a series of keys. It's like a guessing game. <laughs> the more the more I get up and do whatever the fuck I want to do, the better it is. But for me, that will condense down to getting to two to three activities that lead to a result eventually. Because I will get bored by not having results. So hmm. I don't know. If you want results but are just would never do the same thing twice, then that probably isn't gonna work for you, I guess. But it works for me for now. Got it. Would you say that that is like your biggest uh, challenge or like thing that you're working on, like at, at a higher level, like aspect of figuring out the game of life or, or there? Yes. Things? Yeah. As again, it's what do you do with the free time that so you're like using it the best? I mean, like in a way I'm trying to get out of thinking of it like that, but I can't do it. Mm. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know. I don't I feel like that's not even more like psychological question of like how do you how can you free yourself from ever trying to do anything while probably still doing something but yeah the biggest challenge to me is like how to know what i want to be focusing on out of all of the out of too many options right yeah well let me know when you figure it out <laughs> <laughs> i do in, in my so in my options where if there's no clear option i do use like a eerie or it's actually kind of like a permaculture thing i tried to like the way i get into the suits and why i specifically like suits and gardening is because those are like clothes and food that you put in you right you're like in your body it's like using like the zone system where the shit mm. closer to you is in the lower zone mm. so that was why i didn't do like photography i also are if i like didn't have a creative outlet i might count the creative outlet as more of a even being a zone zero thing so that's important too but I was like, yeah, I already am trying to like write and uh, do music. So like, I don't need to maybe add another kind of creative thing that takes much time. Like, right. let me do a more practical thing. And then just like that, but then that's when the fucking around starts. Like, I don't need, you didn't, I didn't need to figure, I mean, I had clothes already. I could have just, my clothing was fucking optimized and I unoptimized it. So <laughs> 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 like, uh, yeah, it's just like, I was just like, yeah, like, I don't, I need to learn more about clothes and in learning more about clothes, I like, became more interested in it and like then got more clothes and now it takes up way more time than it has to, but it's fun for me. So yeah. And it's like opened up a whole new aspect of my life. That That's sort of, that's one way I choose. So like just the, it's this kind of like a needs based way, uh, making sure I have like a creative outlet that I'm working on. And then the other way is if something makes money, like I probably wouldn't do, I'm trying to learn how to computer program, which is kind of interesting. If I had an infinite life, I would probably, that would not be at the bottom of the list. Like I like, I, I think it's like maybe a job that could be good for me, which is why I'm learning it, but that's like a money making scheme. And you know, if it doesn't ever like, if it doesn't get realized, I'm also okay with that. But uh, it's like, there's a money motivation in there. Whereas like, I'm not planning on becoming a, a photographer that makes money. Hmm. Like, that's, that's like not the creative outlet thing. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. It's not like I'm opposed to making money. It's just like I'm not trying. I don't. I think that's hard to do, and I don't want to work that hard at it. Whereas the computer programming, it's like okay, there's a lot of jobs. This is a skill that I think I could learn quickly and be good at. And like, yeah, it's like it's like money is the main focus, and the other shit is peripheral. Like I think knowing how to do some computer programming will be useful, even if I don't do it. And I think like someday I could get paid to take one picture, and that is okay with me. But <laughs> you know, I don't really think it's not. I'm not interested in photography because I think it's gonna make me money. And I am interested in computer programming because I'm like, you know, amongst the possible choices in the money pot, that's like the most interesting and fun one to me. Yeah. Well, and, you know, I was just talking um, with Alan Frugal about uh, when you, as you add more skills and interest and activities to your life, uh, it's difficult to become the world's, to, to become a really successful photographer. It's difficult to become a really successful computer programmer. It's difficult to become a really successful musician, whatever. But, uh, when you start to combine things that are rarely combined, all of a sudden it's like you can become the world's like top 10, whatever of people who combine these three things that only 20 people have ever combined kind of thing, you know? <laughs> yeah. 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 No, it's a, it is. I, I, I really just, I like this kind of like a personality trait that I like having is like doing combining two things that people don't normally combine. So yeah, I find it interesting. I don't, I don't, I don't know if I've reached the level yet where I've, gotten so good at two things and then merge them together and it's like whoa but that's interesting to hear that 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 is a thing that can happen yeah yeah totally i mean that's like that kind of happened in my career i've talked about before like started as a project engineer then i got into 3d design drawing uh 3d design modeling and then i got into like 3d uh rendering and animation and visualization stuff which is like not very much done in the industry and the kind of work i was doing and so it was like oh who's this guy kind of bit me in the ass at the end of it, but you know it was fun while it lasted what is uh pirate captain eerie that is okay that my idea behind that which is this is that was again that was a more fleeting idea that i do like kind of think about sometimes my idea behind that is like really the reason i really like eerie is is because it helped me tie together all these like disparate concepts in my life like i was a like leftist communist when i was like a teenager too and then i just like worked in the music industry which is like the music industry like despite what anyone may tell you is like the most capitalist shit of all fucking time like those are the greediest motherfuckers on the fucking planet <laughs> like, they, it's not only like the most capitalist is like fucking evil and i wasn't <laughs> even like i feel like the business side is even worse like i'm talking about like the artists and the people like those motherfuckers want to get paid and uh so like i was just kind of like well i guess i don't like i don't know you know i was like really into rage against the machine and then i like made me go work in the music industry and i was like i guess i don't live this life anymore and uh then just also like environmentalism but like liking nice things seem to be at odds with each other and it just kind of like helped me uh, take all of the, um, I don't know, it made, me, it made it so I could interchange all of those concepts, which were kind of like cognitive dissonance concepts. It's like, oh, yeah, everyone wants to have nice shit, like whatever that means to them. And like, the, we just like ruin the way we have made, we make shit now ruins the environment. So you're pretty much like fucked on that end. But there, and then it's like, we can make these small differences, you know? And so, yeah. It made me, it, it also made me so like, it like made me feel like I had control over things that I just felt like I had no control over, like environmental stuff. Because there's such an attitude that if you're not perfect and you like are adding to the problem that like you can't possibly help. And so fuck it. And that was my, that was totally my mentality before. I was like, well, I don't know. Like the shit's not slowing down. <laughs> uh, I guess we're just fucked or it'll be fine and I have no power and it's like that's still ultimately might be true but like it's like it, it's like it made me get out of be feeling like I was responsible for the entire world and I was just like no you can still like recycle this can and like maybe that helps something somewhere it's better than like not doing it and you can also like you know it just it, it just allowed me to see like it, it's a very interesting way of like cutting through the way you're told stuff works and also like showing you how your actual actions affect actual outcomes in a way that I like hadn't really thought of before. And like, that is why 
I like got so interested in it. So like the pirate captain thing is just kind of my, it like, it like reintegrated back my like angry 13 year old self who just hated everything around him because I lived it in, but also like how me. I was like, why, you know, then when I was like 20, I was like, Oh, it's such a brat. And it's like, no dude, your life sucks. <laughs> like um, You had all the shit that people told you you were supposed to want, but it wasn't the shit you wanted. And you like, that was confusing and you couldn't figure it out. And honestly it sucked. And so, like, it just it made all that stuff make sense in a way that's, like, I don't... I also don't feel like most people get to have the realization at, like, 33 or something. Like, it was kind of nice. Like, I was like, oh, shit. Like, so to me, that concept is just, like, that's my, like, own little way of doing it. Of, like, reintegrating back in my, like, 13-year-old self who's, like, pissed off that, like, our fucking clothes are made by slaves. And just also my, like, 30-year-old self who realizes there's not... Like, I can't stop that from happening, but I can, like, buy clothes from a thrift store, and that helps a little bit. <laughs> so that's what it is to me. It's kind of, it's just, like, mm. finding the fucking angle. It's, like, finding the angle where you can subvert stuff to the uh, level that you can and not being pissed off at yourself for not the shit you can't actually control. Mm. And to me, that is, like, the most kind of, like, like the you know at least the the positive myth of a pirate of like so it, and i i think i picked pirate specifically because i just i see so, it's again it's kind of the same thing as semi eerie i just saw so many people striving towards this idea i see so many environmentalist people who are just so disillusioned by like the fact that things are in my opinion going pretty badly from that perspective yeah. but it's also like yeah, but you can, like, enjoy there's, like, stuff from the shit that's fucking shit up that is enjoyable, so you, like, can get some enjoyment out of that, and there is, like, meaning in that. And then also, just, like, what control what you can, man. Like, that's what pirates do. They are, like, fuck this, I don't want to participate in the system, but I'm kind of, like, a leech to the system in my own, and, like, I very much define it in my own way. Yeah. So, and maybe some of the problems of that are some of the problems that come with piracy <laughs> but um, yeah. i don't know that, i mean i mean I, for me it's like that as a positive metaphor like just like I, and also just like i think i wrote that when i was living on the urban garden and i kind of felt like it, that shit felt like we were it was my other friend who also i think him and i have the most similar mentalities uh he like he ended up saving money too so like we were the two people we knew that had like money saved and were able to like do certain shit oh we were like living in tiny houses like dumpster diving shit and like growing food and then like but also like there's also like the like gang member piracy thing of where you like kind of like we were like really it allowed us to like give back to the community because we had all this free time and extra shit you know we had like extra food yeah so, you, like, we were, you, like, you were involved with like food advocacy or something like that right like, a, like yes yeah fridges and stuff yeah we have that we had uh there's yeah we were, had we like set up a community fridge um there's like a community garden aspect to it and i don't know I, I like particularly when i was living with that guy because he also he we're both kind of like hippie-ish in our ways but he also is kind of like uh i don't know <laughs> he's can, he can be a little bit of a scam artist sometimes and then like he's this really compassionate giving backside but also can be like really i see to be like really selfish at times and like I don't know. He's just, it was an interesting way. He tied together all these like different things to me that didn't exist. I still like really look up to that guy in a lot of ways. And uh, hmm. yeah, it was just kind of like, like you're, you can be really frustrated that you can't solve the problem or you can try and come at the problem like sideways as hard as you can think of how to do it. And that's what, like what my solution has been. And uh, yeah, eventually, I, I don't know. I've kind of like, I am just at peace with like that i don't have control over the outcome of the entire world but uh, you know there's still some like existential anxiety and i wish that like to get any single piece of thing i didn't have to like destroy part of the planet and enslave like four people and that i'll never meet but that's that's the fucking world you're born into <laughs> and, yeah you know you can uh like to me like the biggest the thing that makes the most difference is like not being hyper consumerist like thrifting dumpster diving like so i really do feel like that shit helps and uh it's not a perfect solution like if you didn't have that system you couldn't thrift or dumpster dive but like i can't stop the system i can only thrift and dumpster dive so that is like that's what it means to me and i guess that actually maybe the like pirate thing was just something i thought of one day but that thing is like really important to me and like 
that's sort of my like guiding principle in my entire life is just like and I, I guess also the pirate metaphor because i don't want to so many people who are ca- caught up in the uh get crushed by the the shitty stuff don't enjoy themselves and it's like yeah or feel guilt or feel guilty when they enjoy themselves and it's just like i don't want to feel guilty i like yeah i want to i want to live it up to so i i think that's a big problem that there's like a there's like a sense in many communities uh that if you enjoy yourself there's a sense that like you have to walk around all day being crushed by the weight of your own despair of the hopelessness of everything <laughs> And it's like, geez, I mean, like, it's maybe not wrong about the facts, but Jesus Christ, it's a horrible way to live. And like, there's a there's a way to live that you're talking about. Like this whole this is this is why I like this concept you so much. This is like, look, you can have a good, you can have a life that has a little bit of joy in it, and not be a part of the problem, and like do something to stick it to the man or whatever. Not that the man actually gives a shit, but like you can and you can help people. Um, you can help other people and not be a problem and like enjoy life a little bit. And I think that at, 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 at minimum, that can be like a, 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 a place where we can figure out how to live and like maybe move on from there. Maybe that's enough. Um, but I, I, I totally agree. I think that like this sense that we have to be self-absorbed in our own crushing despair is such a, we need to get. We need to figure that one out. We need to get past it. And like, yeah, pirate captain UV is like, I think I think it's important. Yeah, it's for me. Is like that. I mean, it solved. It kind of solved all my problems. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It did. I, yeah. And well, it's also like it, it's hard because like it's just natural. Like yeah, it's you kind of have to like separate. To me, a lot of it was separating out like the desires that are kind of natural to humanity that we've like we've all we've wrapped it all in consumerism like the way you meet almost all of your wants and needs and desires is through consumerism which kind of has this makes it tie into the system that is like uh has a lot of negative components to it and just like but those like it's just like yeah like wanting to have a thing that like looks cool or like be in a nice space is like actually a regular human want and then like so I, I, right, I get this the most pushback on the like fashion shit in ERE. There are, people are like, "Oh, it's such a shitty industry." I'm like, "Yeah, it's a totally shitty industry. It's like fucked up in all these ways. Like, doesn't mean you don't want to look cool." <laughs> like, <you do>. <laughs> <laughs> like, like it was, I had that rebellion too. I was always like, "Oh, fuck clothing. It's like shitty. Like, uh, and like I'm not gonna care about it because it's like consumerist." And then I was like, "No, like, why would I not want to wear clothes that look cool and like fit well and?" express myself like those are all positive human traits it's just like you have to buy them from this industry that like is like honestly not i don't know it's not <laughs> when you really go into it not as it's horrible but not it's as bad as every other way we get things we just like pick that one for some reason but uh yeah like and then also like you don't you know it's like it's not about getting the latest fashion trends, which is the thing people are complaining about that makes fast fashion. It's like, no, you could have like cool shit that is made well by someone who cared about it that like fits you and looks good. And like, yeah, there's some part of it that is going to rely on this like system that is like ruining everything that we made, but uh, you not getting that thing is not going to stop it. So like, yeah, I don't know. It's uh, to me, it just, yeah, I'm just like, you just do it, man. (laughs) <laughs> you like the joy you get from it is not the problem it's like this mm. entire really complicated intricate system that has a lot of positive aspects to it as well but like that ultimately no one can control that is like slowly crushing itself or not crushing itself like we don't know that either and like but taking back the stuff from it and like recognizing the actual joy and like why you enjoy something and it's not because you're shitty and consumerist and actually want suffering it's because you just want something to be easy or fun or like sexy or to have a good time and those are like fine Mm. like Mm. you deserve to have those things and just like but we like so quickly tie that to having money right and it's just like not making it not be about having money consuming something or like Mm. wanting to consume something and it's like why do i want to consume that thing oh 
some because everyone wants to eat food that's delicious like of course <laughs> but like how you how you solve that problem has become this thing that's like so loaded with moral implication and and impacts your life in such a huge way but yeah. like just recognizing that the desire to eat a nice meal with friends is like a positive desire and maybe you feel negatively about how you satisfy that desire but like you can have a nice meal with friends somehow it can be okay mm. yeah it's like really easy to get into like a very anti-humanist perspective like to think that like oh just being human is terrible but it's like no, yeah well no <laughs> no i like i don't i don't think that's true um but figuring out like a, a way of life and a practice for living that embodies like a pro humanist way of living in the world is tricky without without just punting and be like fuck it yellow i'm gonna spend all the money and be a you know super consumerist like throwing that line is difficult but i i mean that's what i don't mean i personally don't even think that's the best way to be like a hedonist i just i really <laughs> i really believe we've gone too far down the money like solves everything whole like that's another thing that i'm just like i don't know the more you don't rely on money to solve all of your problems and have all of your fun the more you realize it's not solving that many problems or that fun uh, it's like it's good it's an amazingly useful tool again like everything else equal i would almost always choose to have more of it but like yeah it's like most of the shit you actually enjoy is not most of the shit that you actually enjoy that you use money to get it's not you think it's the money that's giving you the enjoyment but it's like not i mean it's like literally never the money but you know in some ways it is almost figuratively the money but like a lot of the shit there's always almost always a desire in there that you don't need that much money to eat yeah i yeah i <laughs> i don't have anything else to add to that i think that's great that's <laughs> that's that's it <laughs> that's yeah all, i mean that's, that's why I, that's why i like this whole thing is that realization and then when you don't need that all this money to solve it like you're free and you can do whatever you want and like you get even more shit my life is so much richer than it was before i did this and i do like it's it's I've done it for long enough that it's confusing to me when people are talking about like what they're giving up to do it. I'm like, what are you talking about? You like get so fucking much more. <laughs> yeah. Like I have so much time to do stuff and like people to see and just things that I can become interested in that I never had before. Like when I was only trying to be good at one thing and pretty much do one thing all the time and like ignore my body and mind and yeah. It's like to me a much, much richer life than uh, not doing it. I, I think that's a great place to end, man. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know how to go to that. <laughs> that. Yeah. yeah. That's fantastic. Uh, Brian, uh, is there, uh, would you like to, for people listening to this to be able to find you on the internet? <laughs> man, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can think about it. You can think about it. We can add it to the show notes if, if you want or not. <laughs> and we can okay, edit yeah. Anything. Yeah. My instinct is no. I don't know. I <laughs> really fine. don't say this. I mean, I only say this shit to like other ERE people because you have this whole framework of sh of like shit you have to understand and like shit that you have to not do. And yeah, I would not really say this stuff to most of the people that I know in its entirety. You know, I give them I give them the piece that they're that we share together. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Well, if you change your mind, we can do it. Well, Brian, thank you so much for coming on and chatting with me about that. This is great. Um, I'd love to see it again in the future at some point. Um, uh, yeah, that, sure. Yeah. I had a great time. I mean, I love talking about myself, so please. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Uh, we'll take care, and uh, yeah, I'll see you later, man. All right, sweet. Thanks a lot, Tyler. See you later. All right, bye.